Hey guys, today I'll show you a supernatural horror TV series named Fringe Season 4. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama picks up where the last season left off, but takes place in a new timeline created after Peter has activated the Doomsday Machine and opened a gateway between two worlds. They've tentatively formed a united front dedicated to repairing the damage done to both primary and parallel universes. Despite this alliance, there's still a trust issue between them, and with Peter's disappearance, the timelines of both worlds have been rewritten, meaning anything that happened could change. The lead observer urgently summons his second-in-command, who is the sorrowful observer named September. There are 12 observers in total, named after the months. The leader says that Peter should have been erased from the timeline completely, so why are there still traces of him? September is puzzled and takes it upon himself to do a deep clean and remove any remnants of Peter. During a new mission, Agent Lincoln's partner is killed by a person who appears completely transparent. And it's not just that, his partner's face has also turned transparent. The case naturally falls to the Fringe Division. But Lincoln and Olivia don't recognize each other because in this new timeline they've never met before. Agent Olivia wasn't planning on letting Lincoln get involved with this case, but it was his partner who died, and he's determined to get to the bottom of it. Olivia warns him that he'll need to be ready to have his world turned upside down. Then another case pops up. Dr. Walter remotely directs the assistant Astrid to investigate, as he never goes to the crime scenes himself. In this timeline, Dr. Walter's reclusive nature keeps him almost entirely indoors. The victim was killed in their own car, and just like Lincoln's partner, their face turned transparent. A witness at the scene managed to capture the perpetrator on their smartphone. Olivia then says she's about to show Lincoln something even more shocking. They arrive at the morgue and, to their surprise, find over 20 similar cases. There's no clear connection between the victims, which makes the case particularly challenging to solve. Meanwhile, September is at the local hardware store, picking up a bunch of what seem like useless parts. The clerk asks him what he needs all that junk for. September honestly replies that he's going to erase someone from the timeline. The clerk is struggling to keep a straight face. In the lab, Dr. Walter has retreated to the sensory deprivation tank, coming out and exclaiming that he's seen a ghost. He claims to have seen someone in the mirror who even spoke to him. In this timeline, Dr. Walter is quite skittish, getting easily spooked by the slightest chicken noise. Dr. Walter has examined the bodies and found a commonality. All the victims were sick from heavy metal poisoning. However, after their death, the ions in their blood vanished. Thus, the killer must be after the ions in their bodies. Olivia discovers that the killer has a pattern. All the attacks are centered around the commuter train stations, so she sends two agents to investigate the area. Both are attacked. One dies and the other is injured. Agent Lincoln comments that the wound needs professional attention, so he stays behind to tend to the injured agent, tying a necktie around his leg with practiced ease. Meanwhile, Olivia confronts the killer who's busy destroying evidence. They wrestle their muscles, but the main character Olivia manages to overpower the man as always, who is much stronger than her, and takes him down with ease using her skinny muscles. The injured agent wakes up and reveals that there isn't just one killer. Lincoln asks why he didn't say that earlier, but the agent retorts that he didn't exactly wake him up earlier. So Lincoln searches for the other killer and easily takes him down, but the evidence is destroyed. Lincoln and Olivia are still confused by these strange, transparent people. They'll have to wait for Dr. Walter to do an autopsy. Dr. Walter extracts a device from one of the bodies and notes that it bears a striking resemblance to the shapeshifters they've seen before who were biomechanical hybrids. This time, however, they're real people, just modified. Whatever it is, it's definitely technology from a parallel universe. They wonder if someone in the parallel world is carrying out a secret operation. So Olivia takes Lincoln to a place, warning him that what he's about to see might shock him to the bones. And it does. There appears Olivia from the parallel world. Olivia informs her parallel self that they've found a new kind of shapeshifter and asks if it comes from the parallel world. Parallel Olivia tells her not to jump to conclusions because they're also just as in the dark and both of two sides need to investigate this. The scene shifts to September assembling a device from parts, likely intended to erase Peter's traces. But he hesitates and doesn't activate the machine. It's apparent that September has his own emotions and judgment. Meanwhile, Dr. Walter decides to go to bed, but is startled by an apparition on the TV. 
The next day, he covers up anything reflective in the lab. Then, Philip, the head of the Fringe Division, comes to Olivia with a bizarre case. In the last five years, 23 victims have been discovered, all with the same modus operandi, a hole drilled in the back of their heads connecting to their brain neurons. Olivia is taken aback, wondering why she doesn't know about a five-year case. It turns out these incidents occurred in the parallel world, and they want Olivia and her team's help with the investigation. Olivia from the parallel world briefs them about the situation. The suspect, a man named John with an IQ of 250, has eluded capture for five years. However, he has recently slipped up and revealed his address. They want Olivia to find the John from the primary world, as the two share the same genetics, which might provide some clues. John from the primary world isn't a criminal, but a professor specializing in the study of serial killers. Philip insists on this favor. After all, achieving unity is not easy. So Olivia approaches Professor John, but doesn't tip him off about his parallel counterpart, believing he wouldn't accept the truth anyway. She deceives him into taking a sedative, claiming they're heading to a top-secret location. John agrees easily, as psychological profiling is his expertise, and he's always ready to lend a hand. Olivia then brings him to his own residence, but in the parallel world. Parallel Olivia disguises herself as the primary Olivia to avoid any slip-ups. John inspects the place and feels something is off. It seems oddly familiar. He even finds a chair identical to his own. On a wall, there's a collage of photos of strangers. Professor John deduces that the person living here envies these people's happiness and detests their beautiful lives, so much so that they're driven to steal others' joy. Meanwhile, in this parallel world, the criminal John had set his sights on a new target and abducted him. John was stunned to find a photo of his own father on the wall. He wondered if this was some kind of reality show. Frustrated, he decided to leave, but just then, Primary Olivia arrived, and the truth couldn't be concealed any longer, so she came clean about everything. Professor John confessed that he too harbored thoughts of harming others because he was abused by his father as a child, leading to a twisted psyche. However, a kind-hearted woman had saved him from that path. John suggested that perhaps he could talk to his parallel self, maybe even persuade him. Olivia didn't agree, so John took the opportunity to slip away under the guise of using the bathroom. Did he know where to find the alternate John? Olivia speculated that the photo of his father should be at a farm, which might be the place to look. Elsewhere, criminal John was preparing to experience the pleasant memories of his victim when Professor John appeared, startling him. He hadn't expected to find another version of himself in a different world, living a life he envied. Criminal John was dismissive, telling his professor self not to preach to him about how wonderful it is, just let him experience it directly. Consequently, he shifted his focus to Professor John, wanting to see how he became such a good person. To his surprise, Criminal John was also moved by the kindness of the woman and became lost in the beauty of her compassion. Just then, the Fringe Division arrived. Filled with regret for his irreparable mistakes, Criminal John took his own life. Professor John was rescued but lost some of his memory, including that of the kind-hearted woman. Olivia was concerned. Without the memory of the kind-hearted woman, he might revert to a darker path. So she talked to him, and to her surprise, although he had forgotten the kind-hearted woman, he could still recite some of the words she had once imparted to him. This hinted that even though Peter's traces had been erased, his influence remained. That night, Dr. Walter was terrified as he prepared for bed, murmuring to himself not to see any ghosts. But as fate would have it, he kept hearing his son Peter calling out for help. He thought the house was haunted and he couldn't stay in this house anymore. The scene shifts to two senior students who decide to beat up a young boy named Aaron. In terror, Aaron ran and ended up hiding in an abandoned bridge tunnel. Just as he was about to get caught, a black vine-like substance started to spread over the two bullies. Aaron got scared and bolted like a Tesla bike. Olivia is matching someone's image on her computer, and it resembles Peter. Meanwhile, Agent Lincoln has officially joined the Fringe Division. They arrive at the abandoned tunnel, only to find the two bullies have turned into mummified corpses. By comparing footprints found at the scene, they deduce that another child had run away. They need to find this child quickly, in case he's been affected too. Soon they find Aaron. Upon questioning, they learn he's a left-behind child, with his father deceased and his mother often working abroad. He loves to draw, and he's fond of abstract art. While wandering around Dr. Walter's lab, he picks up a toy figure, but Dr. Walter scolds him. It belonged to his son Peter, and he didn't like anybody else to touch it. 
Suddenly, one of the bodies in the lab swells up. Dr. Walter senses danger and quickly places the body in a sterile chamber. A loud bang is heard, and a cloud of yellow-green spores erupts. Dr. Walter explains that these are spores with the ability to spread, suggesting that an aggressive fungus killed the two boys. Another body is still in the hospital morgue, which is worrying. Astrid urgently calls Olivia and Lincoln, but they arrive too late at the morgue where the body explodes, killing two medical staff. Dr. Walter further researches and concludes that the fungus absorbs nutrients at an alarming rate, hence the rapid mummification. Lincoln discovers the fungus spreading through the sewer system, a troubling development. They search for ways to kill the fungus and find that ultraviolet light and heat seem effective. After testing, Aaron is found not to be infected and is set to be sent home, but he doesn't want to go back. It doesn't matter to him whether he has a home or not. He prefers to stay in the lab a little longer. Dr. Walter empathizes, admitting that he too doesn't have a home. The lab is his home. He decides to temporarily take Aaron in and shares his own story about his son, Peter. In this changed timeline, Dr. Walter had brought Peter back from the parallel universe, but he drowned in a lake and didn't survive. The police are preparing to burn all the fungus under the tunnel, but Olivia notices that the drawings on the wall are identical to Aaron's. It appears he visited the tunnel frequently, and the fungus seemed to spread along his drawings. Suddenly, Aaron collapses with a high fever. Dr. Walter realizes something is wrong and urgently calls Olivia. The police were using flamethrowers to destroy the fungus, but Dr. Walter stops them. It turns out that Aaron and the fungus are intricately connected. If the fungus dies, so will Aaron. But how did they establish this connection? After careful questioning by Dr. Walter, the truth becomes clear. Aaron often visited the abandoned tunnel alone, and over time, he felt as if the fungus had a consciousness and empathized with him, even protecting him. Dr. Walter admits his initial theory was wrong. It's not a fungus, but an organism with an exceptionally advanced nervous system. These spreading organisms form a massive neural network that, somehow, connected with Aaron. Several more deaths have occurred, and Philip says we can't wait any longer, saying if he can't separate the two of them, he'll have to destroy it because they can't save a little boy at the expense of more lives. So, the order was given for agents to inject the organism with toxins. As a result, Aaron was also poisoned and it looked like he was a goner. But then, Dr. Walter had a revelation. It wasn't that the organism refused to leave Aaron, but that Aaron didn't want to let it go. He had no friends, so he considered this organism a friend, from which he derived a sense of security. Dr. Walter told him to let go and suggested they make friends. Aaron thought about it and decided that wasn't so bad, and he let go. Dr. Walter sympathized with the boy and gave him the toy figure. Afterwards, Olivia went to Dr. Walter to tell him that Aaron had been settled in, but she found Dr. Walter preparing to operate on his own brain. He said he kept seeing a person and even heard him talking. He suspected his mental illness was recurring and feared being locked up in a mental institution again, which is why he was attempting the surgery himself. Olivia was taken aback and showed him a drawing she had made, asking if the person he saw was the one in the drawing. Dr. Walter confirmed it was the same man and asked how she had his picture. It turned out that for the past three weeks, Olivia had been dreaming of this man every day and drew him, but couldn't find any information on him. Dr. Walter was relieved to hear this, as it meant he wasn't insane, but they needed to figure out what was really going on. However, after a long day, they decided to deal with this headache tomorrow. Olivia went to sleep, but was suddenly awakened by a blue, crackling mass of energy. She quickly sought Dr. Walter's advice, wondering if she had unlocked a new ability, something like a lightning ball. Dr. Walter said this ability didn't sound like something she could have figured out on her own, but it sounded fun from her description. So, Lincoln went to Olivia's house to investigate and happened to witness Olivia being attacked by the blue energy mass, which could absorb various metals. Dr. Walter said he had seen something similar before. 25 years ago, a child codenamed Subject 9, who had been part of the Cortexophon trials for time travel, had demonstrated the ability to project his spirit. Such astral projection meant that the soul could be pulled out of the body and exist freely in the atmosphere. This blue energy mass was very similar to that phenomenon. Since it was always following Olivia, there must be some kind of mental connection between her and the mass. 
Olivia decided to look for Subject 9, hoping he might have some answers. Dr. Walter also wanted to join her, as he hadn't left his lab in half a year and was excited at the prospect, even considering secondhand smoke to be like a breath of fresh air. Upon arriving at Subject 9's place, the lock-picking queen quickly got the lock open, but he wasn't home. His neighbor mentioned that Subject 9 was a truck driver and wouldn't return until the next morning. During this long night, they decided to head to an ice cream shop. They had only taken a few sips of their drinks when the spoon on the table started to vibrate. Then a blue magnetic mass suddenly appeared, constantly following Olivia. But out of luck, it got dispersed into nothingness by a passing car. The next day, Olivia hastened to find Subject 9. Upon opening the door, there he was. Seeing that, Subject 9 took off running like a pig and ended up colliding with Dr. Walter. Subject 9 confessed he was afraid to meet them because of the doctor's eccentricities, which had caused him side effects. He remembered a date with a girl where he accidentally pulled out all her metal dental fillings due to his nervousness, an unforgettable and traumatized scene for him. As he spoke, the blue magnetic mass reappeared. Subject 9 said it wasn't his doing and he could disperse it with his mind. Frustrated, the mass wondered if it was out of luck again. Dr. Walter speculated that since Subject 9 could disperse it, maybe they could destroy it completely. They went to an abandoned power plant, planning for Subject 9 to drive the magnetic mass into the high-voltage area to destroy it for good. The blue magnetic mass appeared once more, and it seemed Subject 9 could finish it off. Suddenly, they realized the magnetic mass was actually Peter transformed. They couldn't kill him. If he died, none of this would make sense. So at the crucial moment, Olivia stopped Subject 9. Meanwhile, at the distant Lake Reedon, Peter emerged naked from the water and was rescued by a father and son who were rowing their Tesla boat without battery. Later, Philip called to say a fool insisted on being related to them, but what was odd was that he knew all their secrets. So Olivia arrived at the hospital to see Peter, and they were reunited, a truly heartwarming moment. However, Olivia's first question was who he is, and accused him of playing tricks and scaring her to shit her pants these past few days. Peter was completely taken aback by her words. Peter's arrival brings a slew of explosive revelations, leading to his confinement in a detention cell. Peter, realizing no one recognizes him in this timeline, refrains from acting impulsively and instead requests to meet Dr. Walter. The appearance of this enigmatic man who claims to be his late son leaves Dr. Walter utterly shocked. Cut to a scene where a woman is frantically searching through her house, her purpose unclear. Her husband, clad in a white tank top, is baffled and inquires what she's looking for. But as he offers to assist, her face begins to turn transparent, revealing her identity as the new type of shapeshifter previously mentioned. It turns out that the woman had been dead under their bed for some time, suggesting a prevalence of these shapeshifters. The shapeshifter threatens the man, demanding certain research materials. The scene shifts back to a tense meeting between Dr. Walter and Peter, where Dr. Walter insists that Peter cannot be his late son, who died by drowning. This revelation hits Peter, who realizes that since that moment he activated the Doomsday Machine, the timeline has been altered, effectively erasing his existence. Confused and feeling superfluous, especially since he has been erased, Peter struggles to understand how he has re-emerged. He seeks Dr. Walter's help to investigate, but the mere suggestion frightens Dr. Walter away. In a dramatic twist, the man in the white tank top is found dead. It seemed that the shapeshifter had acquired the research data it sought. Investigations reveal that the man was not the true owner of the house. The actual owner is a retired doctor named Truss, who used to work for the massive dynamic company and now spends his days tending to his garden and feeding dogs. However, when the shapeshifter reappears, it finds the right person this time. Olivia and Lincoln arrive at Massive Dynamics, asking its director, Nina, for Dr. Truss's files. In this new timeline, Nina and Olivia share a close relationship. She virtually raised her, akin to a nanny. In this timeline, everything is subject to change. Dr. Truss's research focuses on cellular tissue replication for repairing damaged organisms, but the experiments are far from complete. Meanwhile, the shapeshifter feigns illness, and Dr. Truss, driven by a compassionate desire to save lives, agrees to help unconditionally. It is revealed that these new shapeshifters are not yet perfected, their cells deteriorating after a short period, so they seek to refine their condition. Upon learning they are shapeshifters, Peter boasts about his expertise, claiming he has personally eliminated a few and offers his assistance. Philip hears this and agrees to the proposal. At this point, the police, through surveillance, had tracked down Dr. Truss's whereabouts and dispatched officers to investigate. 
Peter actually managed to figure something out. He discovered that these new shapeshifters can store six sets of genes and switch between them at will. This was an impressive and highly elusive capability. Truss quickly produced a serum and injected the shapeshifter with it. During this process, the shapeshifter shockingly took on the appearance of Truss's ex-wife. This spooked Truss, who then tried to flee for his shitty life but was unable to escape. Peter realized that the shapeshifter's internal memory stick was receiving a signal from an abandoned warehouse by the riverbank. Olivia sent people to rush over, but the shapeshifter, skilled in parkour, escaped across the rooftops. Olivia gave chase, but soon lost the trail. Peter tried to communicate with Dr. Walter again, but the doctor accused Peter of being a bad guy sent to confuse him. He recounted making a fatal mistake in the past by trying to help someone else's son and vowed never to do such a thing again. Elsewhere, the shapeshifter injected itself with the last serum Dr. Truss had made, which actually worked. She quickly conveyed this news to the boss, who could either be Dr. Walter from the parallel world or someone else. Olivia came to Peter with news of a bizarre incident that she suspected was related to Peter's appearance. It's reported that a building had suddenly reverted to its state from four years ago, before a fire had burned everything down. Besides that, similar time-reversing phenomena had been occurring frequently over the past three days, coinciding with Peter's arrival. This made Peter the subject of a potential scientific investigation. Dr. Walter perfunctorily tested and claimed that Peter had nothing to do with it, and asked not to have Peter brought into his lab, then he hid in his bedroom. Then another time reversal incident occurred. A group of students saw a train that had been running years ago. Back in the lab, Olivia asked Peter if he was conscious of his apparitions occasionally appearing in the lab and in his dreams over the past few weeks. Peter shook his head. Then the three of them prepared to pack up and check out the train tracks. But in a flash, Peter teleported from the lab directly to the tracks. Olivia and Lincoln had already been investigating for half the day. It seemed that a time jump had occurred. On the way back, Peter jumped from the car to the moment they had just arrived at the scene. At that moment, he noticed that the car was experiencing metal degradation, which he said was caused by neutron radiation, indicating it was not a natural phenomenon, but man-made. If that was the case, it had nothing to do with Peter at all. The scene shifts to a messy man watching his wife solve equations. Suddenly, she disappears, but the man is not surprised at all, as if he had anticipated this. He walks out to the balcony and finds his wife sitting there, seemingly aged. The situation is indeed bizarre. Inside the lab, Dr. Walter listens to rock music, completely unwilling to get involved with the case related to Peter. Peter and Lincoln are marking recent time reversal events on a map but can't figure out any pattern. Dr. Walter, unable to stand it anymore, draws a Fibonacci curve on the map, exclaiming that the pattern is so obvious. The center point of this curve must be the source of the problem. In another scene, the messy man restarts some device, and then his wife reappears in the living room, working on equations again. Olivia and the others, following the center point, arrive precisely at the messy man's house. Realizing his secret might be exposed, the man takes his wife to the machine, which turns out to be able to reverse time. The wife, a PhD in physics, had postulated this theory. Four years ago, she suddenly developed dementia, no longer recognizing anyone. The man is heartbroken and wants to use her theory to fix time four years in the past, to spend quality time with his wife. However, the device is imperfect and can only maintain this state for about 40 minutes, so they must hurry to solve the equations. Meanwhile, the police have spotted something amiss with the house after an officer was shredded by a time fracture. Peter recalls a past case and suggests they need a Faraday cage to enter safely. He asks Dr. Walter to build one quickly. Dr. Walter is astounded at Peter's physical and chemical prowess, unaware that he himself had taught Peter all this. Meanwhile, the messy man's wife tells him that solving equations was just for fun. She never intended to make it a reality due to the uncontrollable risks that could kill people. Peter, donning a Faraday suit, successfully enters the house but is then knocked out by the messy man. Meanwhile, a time reversal is about to occur in an undersea tunnel. Four years ago, this tunnel was still under construction. If time were to reverse, the consequences would be unimaginable. The messy man's wife agrees to continue solving equations, but when Peter wakes up, she persuades her husband to turn off the machine. They decide to activate it later in a secluded place. After shutting down the machine, everything returns to normal. He reassures his dementia-afflicted wife, telling her not to worry, and once the police leave, they will be reunited in normalcy. He then retrieves his wife's notebook, only to find that all the formulas have been blotted out. On the last page, she asks her husband not to bother anymore because her dementia won't go away, but his kindness is all she needs. 
Peter also realizes that this is not his own timeline and begins to search for a way back. As a reward for his outstanding performance in this case, Philip finds him a place to stay and grants him additional privileges. Olivia also realizes how important she must be to him. Peter says it's obvious because in his timeline, she is his wife. Moved by the revelation, Olivia wishes Peter a swift return to his own world. In another scene, Olivia has been suffering from sudden migraines so painful they've robbed her of sleep. In the dead of night, she heads to the pharmacy to pick up some painkillers. On her way home, she spots Agent Lincoln leisurely enjoying a coffee at a cafe. She decides to join him and they chat about life. She asks how he feels about working in the Fringe Division. He replies that it's more thrilling than watching a Daniel C.C. horror film. Elsewhere, a stranger is heading home after work, feeling as though someone is following him. He looks back to find no one there. Just as he opens his door, he is attacked by an unknown force. Police arrive at the commotion to find the stranger dead, his death ghastly with white hair and red eyes. One cop, seeing the door ajar, fires several shots, but upon closer inspection, finds no one there. The next day, the fringe division arrives to investigate. The cop reports feeling an unknown force, almost like a ghost was present. Lincoln finds blood on the broken glass, indicating this was no ghostly act. Switch to a young man emerging from a pool of filthy water. He felt amazed at his own muscular body. Dressed neatly, he takes the elevator down and bumps into a beautiful lady. He musters up the courage to greet her but gets interrupted by another man. After they leave, the young man gradually becomes invisible. It seems the culprit of the previous case is him. Lincoln traces the blood from the crime scene and identifies a suspect named Bryant, born in 1989, but a baby who died four days later. Now that's strange. There must be more to the story. So Olivia and Lincoln visit the hospital and speak to the nurse who delivered Bryant. She describes him as peculiarly pale at birth and frightened of sunlight, classic vampire traits. After his death, his body was taken by a company for an autopsy. Olivia immediately suggests Bryant isn't dead. There's something fishy going on, because the said company is a subsidiary of the powerful Massive Dynamics, and any time they're involved, even the dead could be brought back to life. The pair then consult the director, Nina, who reveals that Bryant's pigment cells could disperse freely, blending him into his surroundings, much like a chameleon. He wasn't literally invisible, but could camouflage himself almost to that effect. This research had significant value, particularly for training spies, which is why Bryant became a military experiment subject. It's revealed that a fire broke out in the lab one day, and the military believed him to be dead. It seems he had survived and took the opportunity to escape. In the lab, Dr. Walter speculates that Bryant might be killing to reveal himself, extracting others' pigments to replace his own, hence the white hair on the victims. If that's the case, he's likely to kill again. And sure enough, another victim falls prey to his deadly spree. Dr. Walter mentioned that what Bryant is doing is essentially slow suicide. When he was born, the distribution of pigment in his body was like that of an ordinary person, which is why his life was in danger. If he were to become visible again, he would still die. In essence, if he is murdering victims to extract more pigments, he would likely kill himself. Moreover, Dr. Walter discovered that ultraviolet light could make him visible. The fringe division arrived at the crime scene and through surveillance found no signs of the doors being tampered with, so Bryant probably hasn't escaped yet. They turned off the power and started searching for him with ultraviolet light. Olivia went on her way to investigate and indeed encountered Bryant. He confessed he had fallen in love with a girl but hadn't told her, not even speaking a word to her for fear of scaring her. So he wanted to become visible to tell the girl he loved her. Olivia, deeply sympathetic, eventually let him go. Bryant then met the girl he liked in the elevator, and to his surprise, she initiated a conversation with him. Although he didn't get the chance to express his love, he was satisfied. In the end, he died smiling in the elevator due to an overdose of pigments. This depicts what great love is about. Lincoln invited Olivia for a chat at the coffee shop if she couldn't sleep at night. Indeed, Olivia couldn't sleep and thought about going to talk about life with Lincoln. It seems Lincoln has developed feelings for Olivia. However, as she was preparing to leave, she was knocked out by a smoke canister and someone injected her with something. It turns out Nina had people do this to her, causing her migraines, and she won't remember any of it when she wakes up. Nina raised Olivia from a young age, so they should have a good relationship. It seemed that in this new timeline, Nina could be the villain. The scene shifts to Peter coming to the lab pleading with Dr. Walter for help with the doomsday device. 
Since it can erase one's existence, it might be able to take him back to his original timeline. But Dr. Walter refuses, saying Peter is a time paradox. The last time he helped, his wife was killed and he won't assist Peter again. Seeing no other options, Peter turns to Olivia, who is suffering from migraines again after being injected, so she takes a few days off. Peter tells her he wants to go to the parallel world, hoping the defense minister there might help him. Olivia warns that Philip won't allow it, as Peter is still under confinement. Lincoln visits Olivia, and Peter has a brainwave. He decides to trick Lincoln into sneaking into the Ministry of Defense of the Parallel World. Meanwhile, in the Parallel World, a new type of shapeshifter attack occurs. The assistant scientist has been investigating the shapeshifters, close to revealing the mastermind. But the Parallel Dr. Walter takes over the investigation, forbidding the Fringe Division from probing further into the shapeshifter cases. The reason for this remains unclear. It's worth noting that in this new timeline, Parallel Philip is not dead. Peter initially planned to have Olivia use her special abilities to send him over, but in this timeline, Olivia hasn't unlocked this skill. So they go to the theater and use the machine Dr. Walter originally used for time travel. This machine was salvaged from the river by the massive dynamics. Peter and Lincoln arrived at the entrance to the Ministry of Defense in the parallel world, pretending to be the parallel Lincoln to slip in. But they were exposed just a few steps in and were taken directly to meet the Minister of Defense. They should have known it wouldn't be that easy, but halfway there, the driver received a phone call and going rogue, took off with them to a remote area. Everyone was baffled by this sudden plot twist. Unwittingly, the three ended up in a scuffle and Lincoln ended up killing the driver. During the commotion, they decided to use the opportunity to create a diversion. Lincoln allowed himself to be caught so Peter could gain some time. Parallel Olivia and Parallel Lincoln were also puzzled, wondering who had ordered the driver. Lincoln suggested tracing the phone call to clear things up. On the run, Peter realized he was in grave danger and it seemed direct contact with the Ministry of Defense was off the table. So he turned to his mother, whom he hadn't seen in over 20 years, but she recognized her son instantly. Peter struggled to explain the complexities of the timeline issue and his mother reluctantly accepted his story, eventually helping him to meet the Defense Minister, who is also the parallel Dr. Walter. After dismissing everyone else, the minister talked with Peter while assembling a weapon. Peter said he knew the minister had many schemes, but they were irrelevant to him. He only wanted help to return to his original timeline. As for the conflict between the two worlds, that was their problem, not his. The minister asked if Peter truly believed he was behind all the bad things happening. Peter's silence was taken as an affirmation. Then the minister called in the assistant scientist and without a word killed him, revealing he was a new type of shapeshifter. It seemed the whole affair had nothing to do with the minister, who speculated that the government had been infiltrated by these new shapeshifters. This was a tricky situation, unlike before when a simple blood test could identify them. Now it all came down to guesswork. Peter asked why the minister was disclosing these secrets to him. The minister replied that Peter was the only person he trusted, as he had no ties to either world. He wanted Peter to convey a message back to the primary world that the real enemy was not him, but someone else, and promised to do his utmost to help Peter return to his original timeline. It turned out the minister was actually a decent person. At that time, Parallel Olivia tracked the phone call to a warehouse in an industrial park. She informed Parallel Philip, who agreed to let them investigate. Turning around, he made a call warning someone that people were on their way to the warehouse and told them to clear out quickly. It turned out he too was a shapeshifter, and on the other end of the line was a familiar face, the mastermind Jones, who was a high-risk criminal originally with ties to a terrorist group. Meanwhile, Olivia, who was waiting in the primary world, encountered the Observer September. In this timeline, the Fringe Division was unaware of the Observer's existence. September was shot and feeling weak, told Olivia that he had seen all the endings and in each one she would sacrifice herself. Then he disappeared with his bald head. The scene shifts to the fake Philip who prepared a poison needle, planning to stealthily take out Lincoln, who was locked up. Just as he was about to make his move, the minister and Peter rushed to the fringe division, demanding Lincoln's release. The minister shared everything he knew with the fake Philip, seemingly without suspecting him. Meanwhile, Parallel Olivia and Parallel Lincoln arrived at the warehouse in the industrial park. The mastermind Jones hadn't run away. Instead, he was waiting for them on purpose. He reached out his hands for handcuffs. One wasn't enough. He needed two. Peter was dumbfounded. This man had been split in half by him before, but now with the timeline altered, he was alive again. The fake Philip came out and told everyone that this man was a mystery, with no records found in the system. 
Peter chuckled and said naturally, because that man was from the primary world. In the parallel world, the alternate man died early. Peter also said the man's name was Jones, a biologist who once worked for Massive Dynamics. The shapeshifter Philip was in utter disbelief, surprised that this fool knew all of their secrets. Peter told Jones that he had seen him before and that the scar on his face came from when he teleported out of a German prison. In the past timeline, Jones ended up like a lump of mud, eventually getting split in half by him across two worlds. Jones was a bit nervous upon hearing this, but still played his mysterious part, warning them to be ready to answer the phone. Sure enough, a call came through. In a hospital, Jones's men released a smoke bomb that could directly dissolve people. He threatened them to release him, or more of this would happen. The minister decided to release Jones, not wanting to endanger the public. Since Jones ingested a biological molecular tracker, he shouldn't have been able to escape. Jones requested the police to show him the memory stick from the fake assistant scientist, claiming it contained important information. After leaving, Jones pulled a trick, sticking a bio-GPS with his own frequency onto some banknotes and scattering them all over the streets. Suddenly, there were so many red dots, making the police unable to track him down, and he escaped with ease. Lincoln secretly told Olivia that he suspected there was a mole. Guessing about the GPS was one thing, but how did he know the frequency? When Jones left, he took the memory stick with him. It seemed to contain something important. Astrid did some digging and found it was just some maps of mining fields, nothing special at first glance. Peter, however, said Jones needed a lot of energy for something big. Before, when crossing between two worlds, he used a super strong battery from Nina's arm. The battery was made from a mineral called amphilocyte, which is inert in its normal state, but becomes incredibly powerful after special processing. Nina's battery used just one gram of it, and there was only one quarry that had this mineral. The shapeshifter Philip was even more frustrated, realizing Peter's specialty. The fringe division urgently headed to the quarry, but there was no sign of activity. Peter, looking at the map, suggested that maybe they hadn't arrived yet and asked them to quickly block the four roads surrounding the area. But parallel Olivia interjected, saying that there weren't four roads, only three. Peter took another look at the map and realized that this map is from the primary world, which means Jones's target is the quarry in the primary world. The scene changes to the minister's wife crossing over to the primary world to find Dr. Walter, because Peter had asked the minister to help research the doomsday device, and Dr. Walter was the creator. The minister was a bit confused and overwhelmed with daily duties, really didn't have the time, so he thought to have his wife come over to persuade Dr. Walter. The doctor seemed to see his own wife in her, moved by countless emotions, admitting he was afraid and dared not help. The wife pointed out that Peter was also afraid that he couldn't return home. She asked him if he could see the image of their child in him. With just a few words, she persuaded the doctor to agree to help Peter. On the other side, Peter and his two companions rushed to the quarry in the primary world, engaging in a fight with Jones's gang. But Jones had already collected a truckload of stones, ready to open the gate and travel through. Olivia gave chase in a car. On this timeline, the friction between the two worlds seemed to be of no consequence. At the critical moment, Peter stopped Olivia, saving her sexy life. Jones escaped, and the situation was now clear. The stones Jones took could blow a hole in the universe. Therefore, both sides held an emergency meeting. But they were clueless, and this guy had strongholds in both worlds. It was tough to deal with. Peter said it's nothing to worry about, saying that he understood him and would definitely catch him. Olivia suggested he come to her hormone-smelly house quickly and tell her everything he knew. Peter hesitated because he hadn't slept in three days. Olivia had no choice but to let it go. It seemed that she had fallen for Peter once again. Dr. Walter called for Peter and relayed the news of the visit of the minister's wife, agreeing to help Peter return to his original timeline. Peter was delighted, admitting that he had always thought the minister was a bad guy, but realized he had misjudged him. Jones was shown communicating with someone, saying that they were working on Olivia. The person on the other side reveals to be Nina. It turns out Nina has also become a shapeshifter. The scene shifts to Olivia summoning Philip to discuss September's visit. Philip shows him a wall full of Observer photos. It seems their investigation into the Observers is just beginning on this timeline. Philip suggests that since the bald man said she would die, perhaps he means to harm her. So he offers to protect her sexy body using his bulletproof muscles. But Olivia believes September doesn't want to harm her but to warn her. In another scene, a strange girl who frowns upon seeing some images and hastily sketches them down, passing the drawing to a man. Seconds later, the man is killed by a falling steel beam, exactly as depicted in the girl's drawing. It appears the girl has the special ability to foresee the future. 
That night, she tells her father about the incident, and he comforts her, saying that God has given her this ability for a reason, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. He advises her not to worry too much and get some sound sleep like a piggy. After taking the case, Olivia and Lincoln quickly find the girl who sent the drawing through surveillance and plan to visit her home for investigation. Meanwhile, as the girl takes the bus home, she is struck by more visions and sketches them hurriedly. She tries to give the drawing to the person in it, but he gets off the bus before she can reach him. She follows but loses him and fails to deliver the drawing. When Olivia and Lincoln arrive at the girl's house, her family denies knowing her. Olivia sees through their lies and prepares to obtain a search warrant from Philip. As they leave, they coincidentally run into the girl returning home. Her father comes out intending to send the two away, saying they just moved in and doesn't want his daughter to be disturbed. Ever since people found out about her special ability, they've been coming to investigate, and even the scientists from Massive Dynamics kidnapped her for experiments involving injections and medication. Upon hearing this, Olivia is taken aback, unaware of Massive Dynamic Company's deeds. The girl's father cautions her not to send any more drawings. The girl expresses her intent just to save lives, but so far, no one believes her. Of course, no one would be happy to see their own death. Olivia sought out the company director Nina to confront her about the incident. Nina claimed they hadn't done anything, just some simple tests. This left Olivia quite dissatisfied. At that moment, she received a call from the girl who wanted to meet with Olivia and returned a drawing she had made on the bus, a drawing that foretold the death of many people. Olivia brought the girl to Dr. Walter's lab for some tests and discovered unusually active waves in the occipital lobe of her brain. This could perhaps explain why she was able to see the future. Dr. Walter explained that future events could be considered as waves projected forward, though normally imperceptible to people. However, the girl was receptive to these waves. She confessed that she couldn't see all future events, only those involving death, possibly due to the strong emotions and wave intensity involved. Upon hearing this, Olivia thought it was perfect since September had mentioned her impending death. The girl could help her predict her own fate. As the girl was about to use her ability, her father arrived. After some persuasion, he finally agreed to let his daughter assist in the investigation. Meanwhile, Astrid discovered the identity of the man in the drawing. Olivia and Lincoln went to investigate the man's house, but he wasn't home yet. Concurrently, Dr. Walter decided to hypnotize the girl to uncover additional clues. Under hypnosis, the girl found herself standing amidst ruins, as if an explosion had occurred. She searched around and spotted the slogan of a courthouse, indicating the explosion had happened there. She also saw the man holding a detonator, indicating that he might be the mastermind behind this devastating explosion. The police rushed to the courthouse to evacuate the crowd and discovered a bomb. The man had taken a judge hostage, threatening to kill him. It turned out that after his divorce, the judge had awarded custody of his child to his ex-wife, and the man, unhappy with the decision, was seeking revenge. The police surrounded the man, persuasively talked him down, and he abandoned the idea of detonation. It seemed he still had a conscience. After the incident was resolved, Olivia met with the girl again, only to find her body cold on the verge of death. She had foreseen her own demise, but was content, knowing she had saved many lives. The scene shifts to an Asian man holding a blue stick, sitting next to an innocent man and telling him he would eventually get cancer and his life would be a mess. He suggested to the innocent man that instead of suffering in the future, he could help him find release. Suddenly, the innocent man's eyes bled and he fell to the ground, dead as a piece of soap. In another scene, Astrid from the parallel world sneaks into Dr. Walter's lab, looking for her alternate self in the primary world. It turns out, in the parallel world, Astrid's father had passed away. She was grief-stricken and had no one to confide in, so she thought of her alternate self. Dr. Walter, overflowing with compassion, suggested they have a meal together to help her cope. After the police bagged the innocent man's body for removal, an observer astonishingly claimed to have found a connection. It seemed that this case was far more complex than expected. Inside the lab, Parallel Olivia arrived because Parallel Astrid had left home without permission. She intended to bring her back, but decided to first help solve the case at hand. At that moment, the Asian man holding a blue rod brought in a woman, claiming her husband would die in a car accident and her life would be ruined, offering to help her find early release before sending her straight to meet Satan in hell. After this, he attempted to murder another man, but the plan failed and he was hit by a car, leaving him in a vegetative state. Everyone in the lab was at a loss, without even understanding the relationship between the victims. 
Parallel Astrid, skilled in data analysis, noticed that all three victims had been to the international airport, despite their flights and destinations being different. She speculated the Asian man was an airport security officer, and indeed, he fled on his Tesla legs upon seeing Olivia and Peter. It seemed as though he could predict the future. They attempted to chase him, but were stopped by security, allowing the Asian man to escape. Further investigation by the police revealed he was a former mathematics professor who had resigned abruptly after returning from a vacation at a lakeside villa, behaving abnormally since then. Peter inquired about the lake and discovered it was Lake Reedon, which seemed more than coincidental. Thus, they drove to the villa where the Asian man had stayed, ready to pick the lock using their trained skills, only to find the door unlocked. Inside, they found walls covered with mathematical formulas and a photo of him with his mother, suggesting they lived together. Elsewhere, the Asian man hid the blue rod in a safe at his mother's place, telling her he was about to become immortal. Meanwhile, Olivia and Peter arrived and fatally shot him. Olivia felt the Asian man knew they were coming and was prepared to die, burdened by his sins and no longer wanting to live. Back in the lab, everyone said their emotional goodbyes, becoming closer. An observer opened the safe where the blue rod was hidden, and the boss recognized it as belonging to the observer September, explaining the Asian man's ability to see the future as a misuse of the observer's advanced technology. Another observer suggested that September may have intentionally discarded it, showing signs of disobedience, possibly indicating a rebellion. The scene shifts to the lab where Dr. Walter and Peter collaborate to recalibrate the Doomsday device to respond to Peter once again. They allow Olivia to test the machine at the request of Philip. The scene changes to a street in a small town where an anti-gravity event causes a plane to crash. Dr. Walter arrives to start his investigation and discovers not only has gravity altered, but the electromagnetic fields are in chaos as well. During the investigation, the doctor gets hungry and recalls a burger joint he saw while passing through the town. The trio decides to eat there. The restaurant owner, initially delighted by Dr. Walter's longing for his burgers and generously offers them for free, suddenly changes his mind and accuses the doctor of trying to leave without paying. Confused, Dr. Walter wonders if the owner is a fool. Meanwhile, Peter discovers an injured person in the restroom, and just as the owner attempts to attack Dr. Walter with a knife, Olivia timely returns from scouting and shoots the owner. Upon examining the owner's eyes, Dr. Walter finds two pupils, adding to the mystery. Even stranger, they find themselves unable to drive out of the town, caught in a loop, leaving them in a dire predicament. Dr. Walter uses his blood to revive an injured teacher found in the town, who informs them that three days prior, the town began to change. Aside from the teacher and a handful of others, everyone else has gone mad, engaging in either suicide or murder, with all communication devices failing, eliminating any hope for outside help. The teacher mentions a school with a radio that might still work, so they decide to head there. Olivia, however, starts to feel dizzy and fears she may have been affected as well. Upon reaching the school and meeting the other unaffected individuals, they find another woman suddenly loses her sanity, oscillating between wanting to cook for her husband and remembering his death in a car accident years ago. Despite Peter's efforts, the radio remains inoperative. Olivia's headache worsens and she asks Dr. Walter to take a blood sample for testing. The teacher expresses his love for the town, having declined an assignment to teach in the city, never anticipating such events. Dr. Walter then uncovers a significant clue. The two worlds of the town have merged once more, and they are trapped in the overlap. People's minds are merging with their parallel selves from another world, causing people to fall into madness and have two pupils. Some people remain unaffected because they don't have a counterpart in the town from the parallel world. For instance, the teacher's counterpart went to the city and thus couldn't conflict against him staying in the town. Olivia remains sane because her parallel self wouldn't be in the town. Such a world merger would require immense energy, pointing to a conspiracy by the terrorist Jones. This is just the beginning. If both towns fully overlap, there will be no place to hide, spelling doom for all. Dr. Walter and Peter theorized that there must be a safe spot, akin to the eye of a hurricane where there is no wind. They quickly calculated the location of this eye, and in a moment of crisis, they tumbled and scrambled their way to this place. 
Afterwards, Philip mentioned that some devices had been found around the town containing traces of Amphelicidae, a mineral that can be used to create a hole in the universe. With Peter's presence, Dr. Walter's mental state had significantly improved, so much so that he was almost reluctant to part with Peter. When Peter went to check on Olivia's condition, she unexpectedly kissed him using her tongue, leaving them both stunned. Olivia said not to ask her why, it just seemed like the normal thing to do at the time, as if it was their usual routine after work. Peter asked how long they had known each other, and Olivia said three months. Peter was relieved that she still had some clarity, yet Olivia suggested it might be an after-effect of their experience in the town. Another case then arose. A patient named Sean in a psychiatric hospital kept hearing a jumble of inexplicable noises, a common trait among many psychiatric conditions. However, the events he heard the previous night actually occurred. Three assailants had broken in and killed someone, and Sean could hear their thoughts. Dr. Walter suggested that this wasn't madness, but a special ability. In the corridors, Olivia also remembered scenes of helping Dr. Walter escape, involving Peter. She began recalling many past events, all featuring Peter, which was very peculiar. Olivia then approached Peter and shared everything she remembered, things that originally only she would know, including various encounters with Peter. Peter was astonished, wondering how she could possess memories from the Olivia of his own timeline. They quickly took her to the lab for Dr. Walter to examine. While they awaited the blood test results, Dr. Walter hypothesized that perhaps Peter's intense desire to reunite with his known Olivia somehow influenced Olivia here. At the same time, Dr. Walter discovered a peculiar protrusion in Sean's DNA, and a similar protrusion was found in the DNA collected from one of the suspects at the crime scene. Dr. Walter explained that such a condition could only indicate a fraternal relationship. But since Sean could hear the thoughts of three people, could it be that all four individuals were brothers? Olivia and Lincoln brought in Sean's mother, who said it was possible. It turned out Sean was an in vitro fertilization baby, which explained that all the involved individuals originated from the same batch of sperm. Inside the examination room, Olivia suddenly noticed a scar on the palm of Peter's hand and quickly grabbed it with emotion, saying that in her memory he didn't have a scar on his hand. Peter replied that he just got it last week. It's quite sad for Olivia. It's like your wife suddenly gets amnesia and forgets you completely. Dr. Walter said that Sean and this group were very much like a hive mind. They communicate with each other to protect the collective and act in unison. They quickly found the sperm donor, a genetics professor who had engineered his own sperm. He had hidden the specific documents in a warehouse. Just then, the results of Olivia's blood test came out. After looking at them, Dr. Walter got furious and confronted the shapeshifter Nina. It turned out that in the past few days, Olivia had been injected with the drug cortexaphin, a substance only available from the massive dynamics. Olivia and Peter rushed to the warehouse to investigate, but were attacked by the sperm gang. In the end, three men couldn't overpower a man and a woman, as if their sperm quality was also questionable. Afterwards, the professor was killed by his own son. He brought it upon himself since he threatened the safety of the sperm gang. In the car, Peter told Olivia that he made a mistake like this once before, betraying Olivia, but he would never do it again. They kissed without using their tongues, but at that moment, Olivia felt a sudden urge to use the restroom, so she went away. Inside the massive dynamics, Nina showed Dr. Walter the stored cortexaphin, saying she was the only one with access here. There were 20 bottles, and she didn't take any of them. Dr. Walter took a bottle and drank a big gulp, then said this was not cortexaphin, but potassium iodide with food coloring added. Meanwhile, Peter waited for another hormone yoga session, but Olivia didn't return to give him a chance. So he went to look for her, only to find that she had mysteriously disappeared. As the scene shifts, Olivia is kidnapped and taken into a secret room, along with the real Nina. It seems like the shapeshifters have evolved to the point where they no longer need to kill to take on another form. Or perhaps the fake Nina isn't a shapeshifter, but the one from the parallel world. Either way, it spells trouble. The scene then changes to Jones, who had Olivia captured and locked in a secret room with the real Nina. As a notorious terrorist, he began to torture the real Nina in hopes of triggering Olivia's special abilities. Meanwhile, the Fringe Division suspects that it was the fake Nina who stole the cortexaphin and secretly injected Olivia with it, so they detained her. However, she vehemently denies it, suggesting that a shapeshifter who took on her appearance might have taken it. Philip retorts that it's impossible because if there was a shapeshifter of her, she would be dead by now. This seems to make sense. 
Philip then brings up the surveillance footage that clearly shows her taking it, yet the fake Nina still won't admit to it, which is stubborn to the point of suspicion. Could there be a hidden story? Jones pulls the same trick again, bringing out a box full of light bulbs. Olivia tells him not to bother with this act again because she's already lit them all up last time. Jones is taken aback, wondering how she can know what he was going to ask her to do. But with the real Nina's life in danger, Olivia has to try again, although this time she can't get the light bulbs to illuminate. Back at the lab, Peter, from the surveillance footage at Olivia's home, adjusts the yellow hue and saturation to identify a kidnapper. Astrid takes the information to the system for identification. At the same time, Peter speculates that the fake Nina might be one of Jones's people. Otherwise, why would she help Jones inject Olivia with cortexophen? Dr. Walter inquires why Jones, who can freely travel between two worlds, would still want to re-inject Olivia with cortexophen. Peter doesn't have an answer to that. Suddenly, September appears to flex his bald head, startling everyone. He's been shot in the chest and is clearly in critical condition. The presence of an observer usually means significant events are about to unfold. There's no time for questions. It's time to act fast to save him. In another scene, Olivia confides to the real Nina that activating the powers of cortexophen requires a special situation, but given their relationship, it should be easy to trigger. However, she has recently forgotten many things about their past, and her feelings seem to have faded. So the real Nina tells her stories from the past, mentioning the time when Olivia first called her godmother after being brought home. Olivia admits she still can't remember, suggesting that only one person could help her activate her abilities. It's Peter. Suddenly, the real Nina feels unwell and is taken out for emergency treatment, but just a few steps outside, she's fine again. Something's up. It turns out this was the fake Nina. It's then revealed that the Nina detained by Philip has been the real Nina all along. The fake Nina took advantage of the real Nina's absence from the company to impersonate her, stealing the cortexophen and injecting Olivia with it. This means that the fake Nina has not completely replaced the real Nina, which also implies that the fake Nina is not a shapeshifter. She must be from a parallel universe. Dr. Walter struggles to sustain September's life. However, his organs are failing, and it seems death is inevitable. Meanwhile, the police identify a man in the surveillance footage wearing a mask, who had actually died years ago. How to find him now? Peter suggests consulting the omniscient bald being before them, but since September is unconscious at the time, they have to enter his mind to search for answers. Peter does just that and feels his life is now complete, having witnessed the moment of the Big Bang. September appears and starts a conversation with Peter, revealing he is from the future, a researcher in the science department where they have the technology to travel through time. Their usual work involves recording history and so on. However, during one recording, September inadvertently interfered with human activities, precisely when Parallel Walter created the antidote that saved Peter. His attempts to rectify this have been futile, and as a result, two worlds plunged into war. September thought erasing Peter from the timeline would fix everything, but Peter popped up again, leaving September exasperated and ready to give up. On the screen, Peter sees the woman he was meant to spend his life with, realizing she is his true Olivia. Suddenly, September says it's too late. They have arrived, and he needs Peter to do something. Peter urgently asks how to find his Olivia, to which September responds, Just go home. Peter protests that he can't go back. But then he wakes up, and September vanishes, with a table inexplicably toppled beside him. Frustrated, Peter says he got no answers. But then he considers that observers usually speak very seriously and wouldn't use go home as a metaphor. Could it be that September meant it literally? So Peter returns to his own place, where someone is already waiting for him. It's the same man from the surveillance. Peter is knocked out and taken away, and indeed he finds Olivia. Jones uses Peter to threaten Olivia, demanding she light up a bulb. With Peter there, Olivia instantly lights up the bulb in the small box, and more than that, she causes all the lights in the room to flicker and crackle as if about to explode. Jones realizes she's taken it too far, and the fake Nina urgently tells her to stop. Olivia reveals she knows she isn't the real Nina. It turns out Olivia knew all along because the first time she called Nina godmother was at her college graduation, not upon their first meeting. Jones sees the jig is up and beats a hasty retreat along with the fake Nina. Olivia uses her control over electricity to kill a henchman and saves Peter. The two pursue Jones, who is about to cross over to the parallel world. Olivia fires her gun, but it doesn't work. Jones's molecular structure reassembles quickly, allowing him to escape. 
Olivia suggests to Peter that they go home together, but Peter apologizes for having kissed her, saying after seeing his Olivia in September's mind, he must go home to find that version of her. The one in front of him is not the one, and he can no longer be with her. Then, heartbreakingly, he leaves Olivia alone in her sorrow. Aside from the heartbreak, there's another troubling matter. Olivia's memories are being slowly replaced by those of the original Olivia, like many of her memories with Nina, which she has forgotten. Meanwhile, a perverse, disfigured killer had surfaced, targeting couples in particular. He would kill the man first, then use the man's bodily fluids to create an aphrodisiac before proceeding to rape and murder the woman in a twisted attempt to experience what he believed to be true love. In the lab, Dr. Walter brought up the surveillance footage from September's disappearance, playing it back at a very slow speed. It was only then that a clue became slightly visible, but the observer's movements were still too quick. It turned out that two observers had taken September away. With lightning-fast speed, they had tampered with Peter's eyes. Dr. Walter examined Peter's eyes and sure enough discovered a tiny disc with writing on it. Deciphering it revealed a special address. Just as Olivia and Lincoln were about to deliver a body, Peter decided he'd better keep his distance from her and headed to the address to investigate. When Olivia found out, she was disheartened. Upon arrival at the address, it seemed there was a door between 228 and 230 that only he could see. Entering, he found what appeared to be September's home. Cutting to another scene, the disfigured killer was in the park searching for his next victim. Back in the lab, Dr. Walter handed Astrid a cotton ball to smell, which almost knocked her out with its foul stench. It was from a beaver, an animal known for its malodorous secretions. This substance had been found on the back of the female victim's neck. Astrid questioned why Dr. Walter wouldn't smell it himself, to which he replied that, after smelling it all day, he couldn't detect any odors anymore. Seeing Olivia distracted, Lincoln comforted her, suggesting they meet at the coffee shop in the evening if she wanted to talk. But Olivia brushed off her heartbreak as a minor issue. Dr. Walter mentioned that the aphrodisiac made by the killer contained castorium, a beaver's secretion that was distinctively pungent yet used to attract mates, making it an unusual ingredient not easily obtained. Astrid had located only five perfume manufacturers that used this rare ingredient. Meanwhile, Peter, in September's home, found a briefcase containing a device resembling a tracker. At that moment, Astrid discovered that one of the manufacturers had fired an employee for stealing castorium. He was the very culprit. They rushed to the killer's home just as he had prepared a new bottle of the aphrodisiac and had stepped out, presumably to continue his horrific spree. Peter, following the tracker's coordinates, uncovered a metallic egg. Olivia and Lincoln arrived at the deceased's wife's house for a stakeout, but the killer didn't show up all night, which was rather odd. Olivia joked that perhaps her husband was having an affair. Sure enough, the killer appeared at his mistress's place. Just as the killer was about to succeed, Olivia and Lincoln showed up in the nick of time and stopped him. After the case was solved, Olivia caught up with Nina and opened up about her feelings. She admitted falling for someone wasn't easy for her. Even if Peter didn't want her, she cherished the feeling of being in love and decided to let things unfold naturally. However, she confided that her memories were fading, and one day she might not remember Nina was her godmother. But she pleaded with Nina not to give up on her and to get to know her again as her goddaughter. Cutting back to Peter, he was staring at the metallic egg, utterly baffled. Suddenly, it emitted a beam of light, and September was projected out of it. It turned out that the other observers had locked September away, and he had deliberately left clues for Peter so he could be rescued. September explained that the metallic egg was a lighthouse, used to guide those traveling through time and space. Peter pleaded with him to help return to his original timeline, but September revealed that there had always been only one timeline. It was just a matter of Peter's existence influencing it. Logically, Peter had been erased, and the others had been changed because of his disappearance. But then he reappeared, perhaps due to the strong mutual affection he and his family had, what they call love. So this Olivia was indeed his original Olivia. September advised Peter to go for it before he and the egg vanished. As expected, the lovers ended up together. However, Lincoln was left heartbroken in the shadows. In a previous episode, we mentioned a bizarre case of a hedgehog creature that suddenly mutated on an airplane. This case has just occurred on this timeline. The characters are the same, but the difference this time is that the hedgehog creature mutated after the plane had landed. Peter thought there was no need for an investigation. He would just tell them all about it. This case also involved a middleman, and the ultimate puppet master turned out to be a professor. Peter and Lincoln drove off to investigate why Olivia didn't join them. 
It turns out her memories were being updated at that time, which affected her work. So Philip decided not to let her participate in the investigation just yet and advised her to rest up at home. On their way, Peter and Lincoln discussed Olivia, with Lincoln feeling quite jealous and unable to understand how what seemed to be an opportunity for him had turned into such a mushy relationship between the two. When they arrived at the middleman's doorstep, to their surprise, Olivia couldn't stand being alone and also showed up. The trio explored the house together when suddenly, another hedgehog creature jumped out and attacked Lincoln. Olivia managed to drive the creature away. It seemed that the middleman had turned into a porcupine, so that lead was a dead end. Time to check on the professor. Inside the lab, Astrid investigated the professor and discovered a new timeline where he had already died in a car accident, which made no sense. This meant that the professor wasn't the real mastermind. At that moment, Dr. Walter found a tattoo on the hedgehog creature, which was in ancient Sumerian script. Peter thought of someone who could decipher it, the bookstore owner. He probably wouldn't recognize Peter, but by appealing to his interests, Peter quickly gained his favor. The bookstore owner explained that the tattoo belonged to a group that wanted to create a new species to advance human evolution. Back at the lab, Dr. Walter discovered that Lincoln had been infected by the hedgehog creature and was going to turn into a porcupine himself, which left him both depressed and anxious. Some people turned to snacks when anxious, and Lincoln picked out all the bacon from a sandwich Dr. Walter had made and ate it voraciously, still craving more fat. Dr. Walter called Peter and Olivia to witness what he called a moment of miracle because Lincoln was about to mutate. This confirmed Dr. Walter's speculation that the hedgehog creature's transformation required a large amount of fat, and a beauty salon had recently been losing fat at an alarming rate, suggesting that it could be hiding there all along. At the same time, Dr. Walter invented an antidote that cured Lincoln. Determined for revenge, Lincoln led a team to the beauty salon and, sure enough, found the hedgehog creature. After a few shots took it down, a woman jumped out and attacked Lincoln. It seemed she was part of the same gang and was ultimately taken down by Peter. The scene then shifted to a secret base where someone had hidden a collection of bizarre monsters hinting at a larger conspiracy at play. The next day, Lincoln went to the lab to express his gratitude to Dr. Walter for saving his life, only to find out that they were preparing to take a cow for a walk. Olivia handed Lincoln a pendant she had found at home with the name of his former partner on it, suspecting it had been left at her place. Lincoln was even more heartbroken after hearing this. Clearly, it was a gift he had given her. It seemed Olivia had completely forgotten her memories from the new timeline. Just then, Astrid came in with a pile of files, records of recent encounters with Jones that needed to be delivered to the parallel world. Lincoln volunteered to take on the task, eager to get away from the gloom of the lab. Upon reaching the parallel world, he coincidentally ran into a case and was promptly dragged off by parallel Olivia to assist. The radio on the way announced that many places previously sealed by Amber were set to reopen. It seems that, following the Doomsday Machine's merging of the two worlds, both worlds are slowly healing for reasons unknown. When they arrived at the crime scene, it turned out that a vigilante had recently emerged in the city, targeting criminals such as thieves, drug dealers, and rapists. The scene shifted to two detectives investigating the newly opened areas where they discovered a hideout filled with bodies. These were all recently punished by the vigilante. Lincoln noticed one of the corpses had three holes in the upper jaw, a trick commonly used by the first generation of shapeshifters. This suggests that the vigilante is a shapeshifter. In another scene, the shapeshifter vigilante had killed a drug user with the transformation witnessed by a bystander who reported it to the police. The police quickly assembled a force and easily captured him. Parallel Philip covertly called Parallel Nina to inform her of the vigilante's transfer location. It appeared this case was again related to Jones. This shapeshifter vigilante seemed to know many of Jones's secrets, prompting Jones to send someone to silence him. Lincoln, seeing that the shapeshifter wasn't inherently evil, had a chat with him. The vigilante confessed to being a loner, longing to do great things but unnoticed. Jones promised to help him, but Lincoln warned that Jones was deceiving him. He was a pure villain. Nonetheless, the vigilante chose to believe in Jones and didn't reveal any secrets, not even realizing he had been betrayed. 
During the transfer, a sniper attacked, but his limited skills not only failed to kill the vigilante, he was instead taken out by Parallel Olivia. But the Parallel Lincoln was shot and rushed to the hospital. Only then did the vigilante realize that Jones was indeed a villain. So he shapeshifted into the form of the sniper and infiltrated Jones's secret base to rendezvous with Parallel Nina, covertly disabling the base's defense system. The police seized the moment and captured Parallel Nina, a significant victory. But then, tragic news arrived. Parallel Lincoln had died. The primary Lincoln decided to stay in the parallel world for the time being, knowing that Parallel Olivia was grieving and wanting to be there for her. At Parallel Lincoln's funeral the following day, everyone was engulfed in sorrow, including Parallel Philip, who was surprisingly upset, indicating that he might not be a shapeshifter. Parallel Olivia interrogated Parallel Nina but got nothing. Instead, she faced contempt and was told they couldn't keep her locked up for long. The scene shifts to the primary world where a meeting is underway. Suddenly, a supervisor flies to the roof and then crashes down, suffering from a catastrophic lower body fracture. Dr. Walter examined the body and was baffled by the extent of the injuries from such a height. Moreover, two other individuals died at the same time in the same condition. One was a pilot. Dr. Walter mused that only a plane crash could cause such injuries. Coincidentally, a plane crash occurred in the parallel world, with the deceased matching the three individuals from the primary world. Such a bizarre case of one incident leading to multiple deaths across worlds was unheard of and utterly mysterious. Parallel Olivia approached Parallel Philip, suspecting a mole in their team. The root of the shapeshifter vigilante's transfer had not been disclosed to outsiders. He urged her to start an investigation and mentioned the plane crash, hoping she would fully cooperate with the primary world's investigation. Given the peculiar nature of the events, Dr. Walter decided to personally conduct autopsies in the parallel world. After examining the bodies, he theorized that the primary world vibrated at a C major frequency, while the primary world was at a G major frequency. Somehow, at the time of the individual's deaths, they were set to the same frequency, which led to their simultaneous demise, as if each person had a twin existence. The recordings from the plane crash suggested that some device on board unified the frequencies, causing the disintegration of the plane, and it was likely another one of Jones's bizarre experiments. Elsewhere, Jones rushes to parallel Philip's house, presenting him with a box of medicine to cure his son, who was once subjected to accelerated aging by a villain. It turns out Jones had blackmailed Parallel Philip into working for him by offering a cure for his son. So like Parallel Nina, Parallel Philip was not a shapeshifter. In the primary world, a car plunged off a bridge into the water, causing an accident. At the same time, the corresponding driver and passenger in the parallel world also died, with identical injuries. It seems to be the same cause as the plane accident. Peter, in a taxi, found a device made with Amphelicite, suggesting that it's Jones's handiwork. In another scene, Jones hands another device to parallel Philip to be installed on the Doomsday Machine. He is torn. On one hand, there's his son who has just started to have hope in life, and on the other, there are his fallen comrades and innocent people dying due to his betrayal. That evening, Dr. Walter stays over at Parallel Olivia's place and sees her drinking alone. They chat and Dr. Walter suggests that Parallel Philip might be the mole. Parallel Olivia instantly dismisses the idea. Dr. Walter advises that to catch a mole, one mustn't rely on subjective guesses but should suspect everyone. Parallel Olivia thinks it over and comes up with a plan. She tells Parallel Nina that she can't escape because Parallel Philip has been captured. Parallel Nina laughs it off, saying he's just a pawn. Parallel Olivia is taken aback, realizing her boss might actually be the mole. The next day, Parallel Philip doesn't show up for work. He has boldly entered the Ministry of Defense. Parallel Olivia and Lincoln rush to the Doomsday Machine, only to see Parallel Philip has arranged to meet Primary Philip. It turns out he has turned himself in. The case draws to a close. As Dr. Walter says goodbye to Parallel Olivia, she comments not to look down on her boss, acknowledging that he knows all too well the price one pays to save a loved one. Meanwhile, Lincoln decides he won't return until they catch Jones, implying that Parallel Olivia might be next on the list to be taken down. In the lab where Dr. Walter announces that he's figured out what Jones is up to, Jones is trying to find a frequency that can connect the two worlds, much like the device he gave to Parallel Philip. If that device had been installed on the Doomsday Machine, the two worlds would no longer exist by now. Thankfully, Parallel Philip came to his senses in time. The scene shifts to an emergency meeting between the two worlds, where Dr. Walter hypothesizes Jones' ominous plan. 
the notorious terrorist has been tweaking the vibrational frequencies of the two worlds, aiming to synchronize them. This escalation of mutual attraction would eventually lead to an overlap, creating a new world with the density of a black hole, an inherently unstable existence that would culminate in a cataclysmic explosion leaving nothing behind. Dr. Walter is convinced that there must be a safe zone which allows the terrorist Jones to survive. In another scene, a group of individuals equipped with unique countdown watches who arrive at prearranged coordinates located in both worlds. As their timers hit zero, their actions trigger massive earthquakes in the vicinity. Suddenly, phones start ringing off the hook, a clear sign of the chaos to come. In the lab, Dr. Walter gathers items from the quake zones, which resonate with the frequency of E major, a frequency that doesn't match the primary world's C major nor the parallel world's G major. It's clear that Jones is relentless in his adjustments of the world's frequencies, and if the quakes continue, it could spell the end for everyone. In the parallel world, a clue is offered by an individual known as Nick, who, just like his counterpart from the primary world, had undergone the cortexophen trials. Nick recounts a dream where he stood at the epicenter of an earthquake, a dream which turned into reality the following day. Surveillance from the primary world reveals his counterpart at the quake's epicenter. It appears that the two Nicks have formed a connection due to their similar vibrational frequencies, indicating that Jones is using the cortexophen children to orchestrate the earthquakes. With the two Nicks' minds intertwined, Olivia attempts to delve into Nick's mind for clues. Her search leads her straight to his counterpart from the primary world on a school campus, about to unleash his power. In a pivotal moment, Peter and his team manage to apprehend Nick's counterpart, but they're a step too late as the earthquake occurs as scheduled. With Nick's watch counting down again, Olivia quickly seeks him out. After being injected with cortexophen, Nick had developed the ability to influence emotions, a power that tormented him until Jones cured him, thereby earning his loyalty. Olivia spends a great deal of time appealing to his emotions and ultimately persuades Nick to reveal Jones's hideout. However, they find nothing there, and Nick seizes the chance to escape, demonstrating his unwavering loyalty to Jones. As another quake looms and with no knowledge of how much more the world can withstand, people in the primary world decide to shut down the Doomsday device to completely isolate the two worlds. This separation would prevent any further damage from the quakes, but also means reverting back to the old state of affairs, with the parallel world continuing on a path of decline. With no other options left, the minister and Dr. Walter engage in their first heart-to-heart -heart talk, exchanging their thoughts rather than hormones. They share a laugh, letting bygones be bygones and offer each other encouragement. Lincoln, sporting his glasses, inquires to Peter about his next move. Peter responds that he chooses to stay in the primary world because his Olivia is there. Lincoln, on the other hand, decides to remain in the parallel world, stating his heart already belongs to Olivia of the parallel world. With that, everyone bids each other farewell, parting with the wish for mutual well-being. However, the day after the Doomsday Devices shut down, the primary world is rocked by a series of bizarre and fatal incidents, with people inexplicably exploding from within. Among them, a heavyset woman figures out that she realizes staying still means staying alive. So when Dr. Walter and his team arrive, they're met with a scene of people frozen in place. Dr. Walter notices the escalator and upon inspecting the handrail, discovers a device underneath, smearing a kind of nanobot onto the surface. These nanobots are highly energetic and will activate with any sudden movement. Dr. Walter suggests they need to bring back an infected person for research. A brave woman named Jessica volunteers. Back in the lab, Dr. Walter quickly figures out how to kill the nanobots, but the antidote isn't readily available. Just then, the nanobots inside Jessica accidentally activate. As she's on the brink of explosion, Olivia, using her unique abilities, suppresses the reaction, astonishing herself. Dr. Walter manages to create an antidote, saving Jessica, and comes to comfort Olivia, telling her that when she was a child, she could also trigger explosions when agitated. Now, it makes sense she can suppress them too. Olivia reveals that her abilities have been unusually active lately, as if they've been triggered but can't understand why. Dr. Walter is unable to provide an explanation. The police review surveillance footage and confirm Jones placed the devices. It seems he hasn't given up his plans. Dr. Walter takes a closer look at the nanobots and comments that they don't seem like something Jones could have fully understood on his own. To his knowledge, there's only one person capable of inventing such technology, Dr. Bell, the former boss of Massive Dynamic. It turns out Jones secretly found Dr. Bell, indicating that Dr. Bell might be the ultimate big boss after all. 
Dr. Walter asserts that Dr. Bell is still alive, but no one believes him. Nina counters that Dr. Bell had cancer and chose to end his life at Christmas, and she personally confirmed his death. How could he still be alive? Suddenly, Dr. Walter recalls a New Year's visit to the mental institution from Dr. Bell, which upon checking with Nina, shockingly occurred the year after Dr. Bell's supposed suicide. Baffled by the impossibility, they decide to investigate the mental institution. Due to the passage of time, only visitor logs remain, which curiously don't mention Dr. Bell's name. Undeterred, Dr. Walter takes the logs for further scrutiny. Meanwhile, a terrifying event occurs. A beam of light obliterates a building. Dr. Walter theorizes that Jones might be concentrating sunlight and directing it underground. Upon investigation, he finds an oil deposit beneath Boston, realizing that if this continues, the entire city could be obliterated. At this moment, Astrid discovered that two satellites were reflecting sunlight. Quickly, they traced the source of the satellite control signal. Olivia and Peter rushed to the location and, sure enough, found the two signals. Inside the transmission tower's lab, Dr. Walter discovered that cortexaphin had the side effect of regenerating tissue. He used cortexaphin to grow the DNA from the records of the mental institution and found a brown oil stain. He tasted it and found it a type of edible oil that Dr. Bell was particularly fond of. He suddenly thought of a place, a port where Dr. Bell used to purchase the oil. So Astrid and Dr. Walter planned to investigate there. Meanwhile, Olivia and Peter successfully shut down the transmission tower. Suddenly, Jones appeared to flex his pride and attacked Peter. Just as Peter was about to be overwhelmed, Olivia, in her agitation, activated her special ability. She could remotely control Peter, and with a few moves, she took down Jones, electrocuting him to ash. In his dying moments, Jones realized that he had been played by Dr. Bell. Indeed, he was merely a pawn meant to activate Olivia's abilities. On the other side, Dr. Walter and Astrid reached the port, hearing sounds similar to that of a wild beast. As they were preparing to investigate, several burly men jumped out and opened fire. Astrid was shot and fell unconscious while Dr. Bell revealed his true form. He took Dr. Walter onto a boat, expressing his inability to endure a society filled with the evils of money and lust. He had constructed a Noah's Ark, and the hedgehog-like mutated monsters were the new species he intended to bring into the new world after destroying the current one. Dr. Walter blamed him for his madness, but then Dr. Bell turned the tables and said the idea of creating a new world was actually his. Dr. Walter was dumbfounded, saying he would never have such a cruel idea. Dr. Bell explained that one day Dr. Walter realized he was turning evil, so he asked Dr. Bell to cut out a piece of his brain tissue and erase that part of his memory. It was only when Dr. Bell was close to death that he understood Dr. Walter was right. So now Dr. Bell proposed that they should create a new world together. At that moment, Jessica called Olivia, expressing a nagging feeling that someone had been following her since she returned home. It was September, but he seemed to be trapped by a spell. Olivia and Peter arrived at Jessica's home, only to find she had vanished, and where September had been standing, there was now nothing but a pit in the ground. Astrid wakes up in the hospital with no recollection of how she got there. All she remembers is that she and Dr. Walter were investigating the harbor. She recounts the story to everyone, prompting Olivia and Peter to rush to the harbor, only to find it had been evacuated. However, September was still there. Baffled, Peter asked the bald deity what he was doing here. September challenged if Peter was too blind to see him trapped by the runes beneath his feet. Suddenly, Jessica appeared. It turned out she was an underling of Dr. Bell's, and the spontaneous human combustion incident had been a deliberate ploy to trigger Olivia's powers. Jessica fired several shots aiming at September's bald head, but he caught all of them. She declared that these observers were not gods. Their abilities came solely from future technologies. Then she pulled out a gun designed by Dr. Bell, and this time, a shot hit him, suggesting his muscles were not bulletproof. The remaining shots, however, were caught barehanded by Olivia, who flung them back at Jessica, ending her noisy life instantly. They were astonished by Olivia's power, who's triggered into a superwoman. Peter wiped away the runes and rescued September, who mentioned he needed to check in the future before he vanished. This tied back to an earlier scene in the theater where Olivia had seen September with a gunshot wound. With Nina's help, they temporarily revived Jessica, who revealed Dr. Bell's location and mentioned that Olivia was the energy source capable of destroying two worlds. Unknowingly, she was aligning the frequencies of both worlds and once matched, it would result in catastrophic upheaval. 
The scene changes to Noah's Ark, where a global storm was about to emerge. Dr. Walter pleaded with Dr. Bell to stop, but Dr. Bell remained deluded, insisting that they would be safe at the eye of the storm, claiming they would be the Adam and Eve of a new era. The police arrived in a helicopter over Noah's Ark's location, but saw nothing. Peter could see there's a huge ship right below them. Nina had a moment of realization, explaining that the veil between the two worlds had thinned and the ship was out of sync with this world's frequency. Peter, from another world, was the only one who could see it. To put it simply, the ship could be considered as already existing in a parallel universe. Olivia couldn't see the ship, but she could touch it because of her cortexophen abilities. Peter could see the ship, but couldn't touch it. So to board the ship, they had to work together. Once they successfully jumped onto the ship, they encountered Dr. Bell, who was surprisingly happy to see them, saying he and Dr. Walter no longer needed to be Adam and Eve. Unexpectedly, Dr. Walter turned and shot Olivia to death, stopping the path to world destruction. It was an outcome September had previously hinted at for Olivia. Seeing the situation was hopeless, Dr. Bell decided it was time to make a quick exit. Peter, cradling Olivia in his arms, was sobbing like a giant baby. Dr. Walter tried to push Peter aside, insisting that Olivia could still be saved. Peter retorted that she's been shot dead as shit right in the head. How could they save her shitty life? Frustrated, Dr. Walter slapped Peter and yelled at him to get lost with his smelly bullshit. He explained that cortexophen has self-healing properties, but the bullet needed to be removed first. Grabbing a punch, he knocked the bullet out, and sure enough, Olivia's self-healing kicked in, and she was resurrected. However, it seemed as though her special abilities had vanished. After things settled down, Olivia discovered she was pregnant. Just when everyone thought it was all over, September suddenly appeared in the lab, announcing that it was time to gather the team as a great enemy force was approaching. The scene shifts to a new plot taking place in the future year 2035, which paves the way for season 5. A few lines of quick text flash by explaining that the observers come from the future. At first, they only observed, especially at critical points in human history. But in 2015, they did more than observe. They began to interfere and seize power. The people rose up in resistance, but their bloody sacrifices were in vain. Those who survived are known as the natives. Some of the natives became followers of the observers, marked and working for them. The Fringe Division fought back against the observers, but were suppressed quickly. Up to now, while the Fringe Division still exists, they are only responsible for handling some disputes among among the natives. The human regime was seized and remains in observer's control to this day. The scene changes to a place of entertainment where the observers are indulging without restraint. An observer grabs a sexy girl, intending to amuse himself, but the owner, unable to stand by, seizes the opportunity to claim the girl is already booked. However, the observer decides to execute the girl on the spot. The owner throws a heavy punch and now there's big trouble. That's considered resistance. The lead observer plans to execute the owner with telekinesis, but just then, a girl appears and saves the owner, speaking well on his behalf and convincing the observer to spare his life. The lead observer probes the girl's mind and, finding no issues, releases them both. It turns out the two know each other. The owner says he provoked the observer on purpose to prevent him from reading his mind and uncovering their plan. This girl seems to have special abilities that could prevent the observers from reading her mind. What exactly is their plan? It turns out he has found something very important. The girl glances at it and asks where the others are. Just as the owner is about to respond, he's killed by a follower, and what he found was Dr. Walter protected in Amber, who was one of the original Fringe team. The girl heads to the Fringe Division to find Agent Simon with the beard. It turns out the girl is also an agent of the Fringe Division, named Henrietta. Henrietta shows Dr. Walter to Simon, who thinks that it looks like Dr. Walter intentionally embedded himself in the Amber, wondering if it could be to hide something. In the year 2035, the head of the Fringe Division is still Philip, but he is forced to obey the lead observer, who orders him to keep the natives in line or face the dissolution of the Fringe Division. Simon later discovers that the Amber is of the third generation, which can re-solidify instantly after vaporization. They need a special method to extract Dr. Walter. Henrietta brings in a jet gun, and in the moment the Amber is vaporized, she sprays Dr. Walter out. After waking up, Dr. Walter immediately asks for food. It's understandable since he's been enclosed for 20 years and hunger is expected. Henrietta projects a hologram of a device and explains that according to historical records, he and his team designed this device to combat the observers, but it was never built before they disappeared. She asks if he remembers any of this. Dr. Walter, however, is preoccupied with eating. 
After being encased for 20 years, his brain has atrophied to some extent, and he has become somewhat mentally deficient. Therefore, Henrietta has no choice but to seek out Nina with white hair, who works in the science department. It's unclear why she is in a wheelchair. Upon seeing Dr. Walter, Nina is overwhelmed with emotion, but Dr. Walter has forgotten her. Nina mentions there might be a way to cure him. We know that Dr. Walter had three pieces of brain tissue removed by Dr. Bell in the past. In this timeline, these pieces were not stolen by the shapeshifter, but stored at the old Massive Dynamic Corporation. Nina suggests that using these three pieces of brain tissue, along with a growth factor, they might be able to regenerate Dr. Walter's brain tissue. However, the former Massive Dynamic office building is located in the city area, now occupied by the observers and off-limits to ordinary people. Henrietta and Agent Simon manage to get a pass under the pretense of transferring population and make it past the security checkpoint. The place is teeming with observers. One false move could spell disaster. Massive Dynamic Company had a motion detector, and it detected someone messing with Philip. For some reason, they reported it to the lead observer. Simon and Henrietta obtained three pieces of brain tissue, melted them down with growth nutrients, and injected them into Dr. Walter's brain. While waiting, the two shared stories about the observer's ruthless invasion, burning, killing, and looting. It's truly horrific. While they were talking, Dr. Walter woke up with his IQ restored. Just then, an observer and his squad arrived in an impressive show of force. The doctor said they needed a few familiar faces to build the device, so they had to rally the troops quickly. The apprehension squad was about to move in when Dr. Walter led them down a secret passageway. After all, he was a major shareholder of Massive Dynamic. But the passageway was blasted open by an observer's shot. In a minute, Dr. Walter made an anti-gravity bomb, sucking the apprehension squad and the building into a black hole. A genius move indeed. Henrietta and Simon were stunned. With a genius like that, defeating the observers seemed possible. Dr. Walter led the two to the rest of their team encased in amber, first rescuing Astrid, but then the jet gun broke. As Philip was about to lead his team to them, Simon made the ultimate sacrifice to save Peter. Philip found a piece of Dr. Walter's favorite food, sensing something was off. In the car, Astrid asked why Dr. Bell wasn't saved. Dr. Walter was surprised, mentioning that in this timeline, Dr. Bell was not a good man, and he did something terrible to Olivia. But he had to cut off Dr. Bell's hand because they needed his palm print to access a certain place. Peter consoled Henrietta, ensuring they could still rescue Agent Simon. She asked Peter if he recognized her. Peter was puzzled, looked closer, and finally realized that Henrietta was his and Olivia's child. It was a touching moment of father-daughter recognition, but what path lay ahead for them? To find out what happens next, please tune in to Season 5. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.